testing, testing one, two, three, testing four, five, six. Hey, Nika, testing. <laughs> testing one, two, three, testing four, five, six. Hello, testing one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh yeah, just you can that's the same texture where it's just a loop. Yeah. You might maybe you I never work on it. <laughs> so I just like my hair is just curly enough that I can just get on it wet. Oh this is just uh I just have it up in a ponytail holder. Yeah, it's only about that long. Yeah, you can your hair like that. Thank you. Is this distracting if I have my big old bag up here? No, because I put it on the Um, I'm just going to pull up. Um, it's all on. You can take your mask off when you're speaking. Okay. Um, but if I can have you do a test in there. Sure. Testing. Oh, testing. <laughs> it should break into a song. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You want me a little closer to the mic? Okay. And then maybe I'll have to do that. Yeah. Is that good? 
So you're going to control the slides or you want people to control them? I want to control them. Okay, so yeah. Got so I'll get that. All right. Sure. Yeah, that would be good. So I don't kind of straining. That's great. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it's not too much. I'll try to kind of ignore it. Okay. Cool. Yeah, of course. No, but Sure. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking to me. I'm like, what? Sure, how's that? That's comfortable and good. Yeah. Okay. Look at the camera. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Hi. So we'll wait one minute. Vintage. <laughs> oh, it's cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hello. Welcome to our first welcome to our first gallery talk since COVID. Horizon House is fortunate to have Katie Stone uh, come and talk about her her work. She is widely exhibited and including um, right here. That's so important, right? Um, she is represented by galleries in uh, New York, Oakland, and Denver. So um, we're lucky to have her. Oh, oh, and Seattle. What's your Seattle gallery? Jay Reinhardt. So I'm mostly familiar with Katie's wall installations, but she works in lots of different, a variety of materials and often in layers 
So let's let her tell us about it. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much, Margaret. And it's a real delight to be here again. Um, it's been many years and I always really enjoy coming back and uh, seeing this piece, which was a significant piece for me. And um, it's really just an honor to get to share some time with you and tell you about my work. So um, as you can all appreciate, I'm getting to that point in my own career where it gets a lot harder to put a slideshow together because I have decades of work now and it's kind of hard to edit. So um, I thought that hopefully I haven't put together too many images for you. And if I get going and I'm not all the way through, we might skip over some because it's always better to have more than not enough. That's kind of one of my uh, MOs anyways, you'll see, I like accumulation of lots of stuff. So, um, so yeah, I thought I would do kind of a, a chronological talk. Um, there's a lot of different ways to approach artist talks, but one of the things that I find fascinating is how a person started out and what their influences were and, and how they got to where they're going. And I've just recently crossed a threshold that I hope you'll see where I kind of started to be re-influenced by work that I made 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago when I was an undergraduate student, a baby painter, as I like to say. And, um, and so, that's partly why I decided to do this talk in the format of a chronological talk. So the image that you're looking at right now on the screen is the backyard of my childhood house. I grew up in Iowa, in the country, um, not on a farm, but in rural Iowa, and spent a lot of time outside. Um, not venturing very far from this backyard, but having a lot of deep adventures in the backyard. And as I came to realize over the years, being in nature and having a very specific feeling and experience of being surrounded by nature has been a really important part of my work. And so um, with that image as a really early influence, I'm gonna share with you some of the artists that have been my influence because, you know, as artists, we're all just part of the stream of creative people and we're kind of all reinventing what has come before us. So this is an image by Charles Birchfield. Did it advance? Let's see, okay. This um, piece is uh, an homage to an American chestnut tree. And Charles Birchfield's work has been a really big influence on mine, growing so over the recent years because his work with um, place and nature and kind of like the hidden undercurrents of energy in nature and the spiritual connection to the landscape and the trees and plants and seasons is really manifest in his work. And I find his work incredibly um, interesting also in the way that he blends representation and abstraction. So the next image is Hokusai and I, Sometimes joke, maybe irreverently, but I think in a previous life, if there is such a thing, I was like a hermit painter in the Chinese or Japanese tradition, because I find that there's a lot of influence of the aesthetic of um, art from Japan and China that comes forward and surfaces in my work in ways that I kind of find mysterious. Um, there's a way that these heroic, um, waterfalls and the power of nature and its energy and essence is always communicated so elegantly through Japanese and, and Chinese art. And that has been a really big influence on me. The next image is um, by Odilon Redon, who's a French 
symbolist painter from the late 1800s. This, this piece is called, um, it's called flower clouds or cloud flowers. I put notes on my presentation and it doesn't, oh, it's called flower clouds. Here we go. I'm to the right slide now. I loved Radon's work from the beginning because of the way it made me feel. It's kind of mysterious and moody, uh, thoughtful, and kind of um, just had this tinge of things that felt very real and also kind of beyond the world that we're living in. And this image as well is called um, Eye Balloon. And I think it's very interesting and strange and feels very dreamlike. And it puts you in a, a state of curiosity. And there's always a little bit of melancholy or longing or distance in Radon's work that I find very compelling. So these were early loves. And I should say that Radon is an outlier because um, his work is, has imagery in it because I was actually always really attracted to abstraction. And this is a, the painter Joan Mitchell, who is a 20th century master. She took the language of abstract expressionism and just exploded it with color and mark and like a celebration of, um, she was really influenced by nature and landscape as well. And this is a really gigantic series of um, four canvases. I looked at her work all the time as a young baby painter when I was in my 20s. And um, it really just spoke to me. And this is part of a movement that was became to be known as the abstract sublime. And the abstract sublime took those um, ideas about romanticism and landscape and the American sublime that originated in the early 20th century, the 1800s with the, the Hudson River School painters and painters like Albert Beardstadt who painted the American West. And in the 20th century, artists started to channel that same sort of feeling, but with abstraction. So that was a really big influence on me as well as um, this other type of, I would say that this isn't quite in the realm of traditional historical sublime painting, but I find it in that middle ground. It's sort of in between um, something that feels heroic and intimate. This is a painting by Gustav Klimt. And I love Klimt's landscapes. I first found them when I was 21 in a bookstore in a book in Chicago, and they just completely blew my mind. I love how mysterious this is. Um, if you look at the top, it's called the Forest of Furs, and there's these tiny little pokes of light that are peeking through. And there's a really just strong presence of, of spiritual feeling here and place and far awayness and something that feels very real and also feels completely born of the imagination. So these are things that are really compelling to me from artistic influences. And this is um, morphed into when I got into graduate school, this other branch of what I would call another kind of the sublime. I skipped an image. This is the sublime of um, my childhood in the 1970s. <laughs> and it's this whole other brand of sublime that it's kind of like color and texture and shag carpeting and all of that crazy stuff that is part of, um, very much part of my middle-class life. And um, I kind of started to think about when I was in graduate school, about what had to do with me as a person. Um, and this kind of material tactility figured heavily into the mix. I also started to look at uh, 
pop art and Roy Lichtenstein. And these are those exaggerated, heroic, abstract, expressionist brushstrokes. But he's taken them and put the comic book twist on it. And um, I just think that Lichtenstein's work is brilliant and interesting. And I love the way that it's very bold and graphic. It also owes a big debt to Chinese and Japanese aesthetic. You can see some of those hokusai waterfall marks in there too. Um, and this is a piece by a painter whose name and a sculptor whose name is Linda Bangles. And this is from the early 70s. It's called Fallen Painting. I'm having a hard time not being able to see the screen and know that I'm like not skipping ahead. So I hope it's not distracting if I sometimes step out and look. Um, so I started to get really interested in, in like the idea that painting could be an object, not just a picture. And the way that that material sensibility could inform your artwork. And so um, I was really influenced by sculptors like Eva Hesse and um, Judy Pfaff, who is uh, uh, still alive and with us and uh, in her late 70s now, and just a brilliant artist who took the language of painting and the language of sculpture and the language of space and started to combine it in just really interesting ways where there's all kinds of references and you're aware of motion and you're aware of construction and color and there's an exuberant movement. So these are all artists that have really influenced my work. And this is Judy Pfaff. Oh, sorry. See, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. there, there's Judy Pfaff. So I got to have a show with Judy Pfaff in 2012 at Robichon Gallery in Denver, and it was an absolute delight to meet her and share a gallery space with her. It was just a complete pinch myself moment. So um, love Judy's work. So here we come to me. This is a very early painting of mine. So you can kind of see that um, the interest Okay, I might have to peek out every single time. Could I creep this thing forward just a tiny bit? No, okay. Um, so what I have on the screen is a painting of mine from um, 1991. I think it is. This piece is a diptych. It was six feet tall and each panel was four feet wide. And you can see those kind of big atmospheric landscape, mysterious, dark, um, moody. And also um, this thing about light and the permeation of light is this very strong thread in my work. And um, the next image is an earlier work that's actually on paper. And I'm showing you this because I love materials and I was always really drawn to paper, but I was kind of indoctrinated with the idea that if you were gonna be a serious artist, you had to use oil on campus or you weren't a real artist. And in fact, my first love was, was paper and its tactility and the way that you could use water media on it. And so I did my work and, you know, tried to work on with oil on canvas. And this next image is a later piece from later in my, when I was an undergraduate. And you can see that um, I'm kind of starting to move toward breaking up those more geometric planes and it's a little bit more landscape. Um, the other thing that I think always describes my work is the word lyrical. And I think this piece is very lyrical. It was called Third September, but it just has like a beauty and a movement to it that um, even as you'll see in the next many slides, how things have shifted and changed over the years. And I think there's also a sense of light in this piece as well. But the this is a nice transition to the work that I started to do in graduate school when I kind of threw the idea of oil on canvas out the window because I didn't like painting on oil 
on canvas. I didn't like canvas. I really liked delicate materials and I began to explore that. And I started to explore it in an extreme way. You can see kind of like how the paintings just sort of spread apart and jumped off the wall. And um, this, it, this image is actually out of order. So I'm going to move to the next slide. So this is an image of mine from graduate school. And uh, it was called Sound Running. And I was at the time doing all of these um, very initial painterly marks instead of collapsing them onto one singular surface of a canvas. I was painting all of them on separate layers and then putting them together and really exploring the idea of um, transparency and translucency. And that's really interesting to me um, to either have a transparent surface to work on or a translucent surface to work on. Also the idea that something could spill onto the floor and occupy a space that wasn't just within the rectangle was really exciting to me. And so my work really moved in that direction. So I'll pop back to the, the, the previous slide. This was postgraduate school and I started to collect three-dimensional material embodiments of the marks that I was making. And I wanted to point out the image that would be on, on the, the one with the yellow in it. That's the first time that I ever used this material that has become pivotal in my practice. It's a material called Duralar and it's transparent plastic material. I went to Boeing surplus and bought a box of these overhead transparencies and started painting on them. And um, it changed everything. I was gonna, this next image shows you a little bit more expanded. Oops, did I go the wrong one? So this one is, um, this is a, a few years postgraduate school. I got my MFA when I was only 24. <laughs> it was so long, it was, you know, I was really young and I just wanted to go straight through art school. So this was a few years later and I had continued this practice of drawing, but I was using all like tracing paper and layers. And so you can see that, that idea about light it literally became embodied in the material. The material weighs nothing, it's weightless, it's transparent and it permeates light in a different way than depicting the light might. Um, the thing about this piece that brings it into the realm that I wanna talk about is the way that materials are so evocative. Oops, should I keep talking? Okay, materials are so evocative. This piece actually, was in a room that had a ceiling fan. And because the, the drawings didn't weigh anything, the pages started to rise and fall intermittently. And it was this magical thing. It didn't make any sound. What's that? Oh, super, thank you so much. That's great. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's me at like age, I don't know, I was like 28 or 29. <laughs> um, I'm so glad somebody snapped that picture because I don't really have that many pictures of me working in the studio and that's a favorite one. But um, this next image, let's see. Oh, do I still use the clicker? Okay, did that? Nothing is the thing. It's, this isn't advancing. Oh, yep. Oh, great. We're golden now. Okay. So this was the pictures rising and falling. And I think the idea of movement, physical movement is really important in my work, but also just evoking motion. So I wanted to show you a little bit closer Duralar. Um, and what you can see in that last image is this way of process that I work, which is a stream of consciousness mark making and then putting things together. So this installation is several hundred tiny uh, collages that are all acrylic paint on clear mylar. So I figured out 
through many years how to work with the material. And um, here's some close-ups of it. This was for a group show that was called Multi. And it was the idea of um, images evoking all different kinds of presences and associations. And I love that. That's why I love abstraction, because it can take you different places. So here's a detail. And um, I painted all of these marks at separate times and then arranged them together to create this little form that kind of looks like a flower or a cloud or an insect or um, a landscape place. Um, these are all tiny, like the size of uh, specimens. And you'll see also in my other work, I like to put big things with small things. But also I think my work is monumental in the sense that even when it's tiny, it evokes something very big. So both of these are watery and they reference um, waterfalls. They also reference processes in nature, something that's happening that might be mysterious or unknown growth unfolding. Um, I'm a big avid gardener and I just am fascinated by the way plants look at different stages. And so you'll see that. Uh, this piece is a little bit bigger. It's called Vincent's Moon. And um, this is probably about 12 inches tall and um, maybe seven or eight inches wide. And um, one of the things I figured out on the way along the way is that all of my work usually floats off the wall a little bit, much like the piece here sticks off, sticks out of the wall. Um, that kind of way of working in space is really important. Um, this, this is one of my drawings. This one actually isn't a sculptural piece that is pinned to the wall, but it's actually a collage drawing. But um, this one's called Water Wheel. And it's about 24 by 36. So this kind of brings um, the idea of accumulation is just part of my practice. So here's a little studio peek. And what I do is I generate lots and lots of marks. And these were specifically generated for a piece that I did at Facebook. But I love just painting mindlessly and repeating and then building it up and then doing something with it. And so in some ways, it's like the parts start to become a raw material like paint where I just start moving them around. Here's another nice studio shot where uh, you can see that I have drawings going all the time where there'll be collage drawings at different stages on the tables. And then very back on the back wall, is um, a work that is in progress that is made of laser cut aluminum. And so one of the breakthroughs I had with the piece that I made for you here is that when they approached me about doing the, the winds reflection, the parameters were that they wanted something that would activate the stairwell, but it couldn't actually be attached to the ceiling. And of course, all of the dural art that I work with is floppy. And so I was like, well, that's not going to work because it would have to attach to the ceiling and hang down. And I started to imagine what if one of my painted forms that was on a clear plastic material, if you just got rid of the plastic, you would have a cutout shape. And I realized that if I worked with metal, I would be able to realize my drawn or painted marks in a new way and I could attach it to the wall and it could stick out in space because it's rigid. So this piece behind you that lives here was a very significant piece in my artistic evolution and led to all kinds of bodies of work with, with laser cut metal. Um, here's another piece that was done a few years later it's called Candy Sky, and that's all aluminum. It's laser cut aluminum and painted with acrylic paint. Um, this one's from 2011. And um, I like that you can't really tell what the material is. And you can see um, as we go along that there's different degrees of abstraction. So this piece is probably the piece at Horizon House and this installation is probably 
the most pictorial that I've gotten with my work. And I kind of have this way that my work arcs back and forth between representation and abstraction. So, so this was done in uh, 2008, the year after I did the Horizon House piece at the um, Missoula Art Museum. And I lived in Montana for five years after graduate school. And so this was like a um, homage to all the seasons. And it was created through replication of just repeating shapes and over and over painted on the Duralar. And I went there with all these parts and I didn't totally know how it was gonna come together or unfold. And it ended up being this um, cherry blossom snow that turned into cherry blossom forms that turned into these calligraphic strokes that look like a mountain from a distance. And then you can see um, these moments that evoke the feeling of grass and there's little surprises hidden in the landscape. And, and then the shape started to form and at the very end, it catches on fire. And uh, I'll go back. You can kind of see way down there at the end, the flames. I'll go back to the that first image because you can see how the landscape burst in the flames and it had a very continuous feeling. So that was an homage to Montana and living there for a time after I left. Um, this was made when I was back in Seattle and then went there to install it. So this one's really pictorial and fun and playful and um, kind of grand. It also represents the idea of being in a piece that feels like a painting, but you're also kind of inside it and um, or a sculpture that you're inside of that you can move around, that you can sort of use your own little viewfinder to isolate moments that are interesting. And I wanted to just talk about scale for a minute. I mentioned it for a second where I talked about the idea of micro macro or things that are monumental and tiny or things that are vast. And I think that relationship's really interesting between big and little. And um, so this is actually an ant. <laughs> and then the other image is of a butterfly wing. And they both look gigantic, even though they're really tiny. And they both feel very far away. Um, and it's just something that is an essential feeling that I feel like my work tries to capture and often conveys. And so this idea of working from nameable sources has always crept into my work over the years. This is an amazing image of um, a mushroom fungus, but it also totally reminds me of um, a willow tree. And it's also just this beautiful form that's draping, graceful and elegant. And um, this, I feel like that kind of presence that that living being has is something that my work shares. So this is a piece from 2002. Um, it's painted on Duralar and a small sculptural assemblage. And uh, it's um, an homage to the willow tree. And I realized over the years, the willow tree is like a, it's a recurrent symbol that I come back to because they're so beautiful. And they're also, they have like powerful cultural associations of like passage of time and sadness and beauty and majesty and they grow by water. So it's like all of those things mixed together that I think are very compelling about that form and source. Um, and this is a much larger willow piece that is from a later show in Seattle at two, in 2005. So you can see how I like to go between tiny and, and big. And then this was a piece that was done in 2014. And this one is a laser cut aluminum that's painted, but it is that same um, willow theme. This is at Jackson National Insurance Company at their headquarters in Michigan. And I just love the way this piece came out. 
And um, the other thing that I haven't really talked about much is um, shadows. And my work is so informed by shadows. That's why I start holding things off the wall because the shadow does this amazing thing where it creates a secondary image um, on the wall. And the other thing is that the shadow is immaterial. And so it's, it's the one thing that you can see, but you can't touch it. And if the light is turned off, it goes away. And that kind of relationship between fleeting time and um, movement and change is embedded in my work through using light and shadow. Uh, this is a smaller uh, shot from my first solo, solo show with a gallery that represents me in New York, Ryan Lee. And um, this is another uh, movement of the willow piece. This one predated the, the green, the much larger green piece. But um, this idea of kind of like dissolving things, morphing and changing and time and is embedded in this image too. And I like the way that this looks digital and mathematical, but it also looks natural. And it evokes that feeling of a process happening that's um, unknown and mysterious, but definitely suggestive. So uh, this image is a is an example for you of how I'll think about and create on the computer drawings for big, large installations. So this is a scale sketch that I made using um, my computer for uh, an installation that I got to do at the Watkin Museum in 2016. And the show was called Color Fast, and it was all about materials and color. So it was such a joy to get to participate in the show because my work is very much just, besides being about nature and movement, it's also about color and it's about materiality. And so um, this is me in my studio painting and generating thousands of um, acrylic on Duralar and the Duralar comes in sheets and I roll it out and then I just repeat over and over again in that calligraphic brush stroke way. Um, as I mentioned, just being influenced by Chinese and Japanese practices and approaches like the idea of calligraphy and repeating the same mark over and over, it kind of takes you into this amazing state. And then, um, I painted thousands of those little yellow petal forms and strung them on string. And then this is the finished piece. Um, so this is Ray, which is um, the yellow piece, obviously. And then behind it is the blue piece that I called Horizon. And uh, you can see it was so dramatic and wonderful because the black floor just really exaggerated and reflected um, the color and magnified it. And one of the beautiful unexpected things was that um, this piece moved because of the air currents in the space. So the little petals kind of shimmered on the string. And honestly, my favorite way of working is making temporary things. I really like to make stuff that's only up for a little while. Uh, here's a closer up view. And um, this is then an extension of that piece. And this is a permanent piece that's in a building in Atlanta. And it's called Yellow Current. I really loved um, when I worked with the Duralar again painting, because I've been painting on metal for a number of years. And I went back to Duralar again and, and realized there's a luminosity to painting on a clear material that you just don't get when you paint on metal. And so I decided to try painting on plexiglass. And this piece is thousands of plexiglass shapes that are hand painted. And one of the amazing things that happened was that I didn't even know would happen is we got in the space and started to lay the piece out and look how it looks from the side it completely transformed into a rectangle. 
it was like there was that geometry again and I hadn't really been anticipating it because I don't really think three-dimensionally. I kind of think in planes and like a two-dimensional painter would. And so this was a beautiful, exciting um, moment with this piece. Uh, this is a sh um, work that was done just after that. That was actually a show that was called... Um, it was a show about artists that were influenced by Charles Birchfield. So I took that image that I started out with and showed you, um, and I worked with color and some of the shapes that would be in the Birchfield forms. And there's another fall. The fall in the center is made of um, uh, paper that's hand cut. And then there's Duralar and um, aluminum and, um, sequin pieces on the floor. So I'm kind of going back into some of my found materials that come more from like craft or fiber traditions with this work. And there's some details where I'm really interested in just the buildup of flat things that become sculptural. Um, and this one's very art deco feeling. I really liked the way that it draped on the floor and, and had that exaggerated kind of... Um, way that I worked with distilling like the motion of a fall and abstracting it. So now um, I'm coming up to an image that shows you this, tra this trajectory or step or process that I'm finding myself going back to abstraction. So this piece was a direct response to the ray that I made at the Watkin Museum but I just thought I kind of want to pare it down. And I went to the craft store. I went to Joanne Fabrics because that's one of my places I go for inspiration is like just to look at materials. And I found this uh, fluorescent ribbon that was very thin, like an eighth of an inch wide. And I just fell in love with the color. And then I thought, okay, what happens? I got to do a residency at this space in Georgetown called Oxbow, where for two months, I just got to go and play. And instead of trying to make a big heroic piece, I just decided to give myself permission to mess around because I've been doing a lot of big commission work and site specific stuff that requires so much planning. And on the scale of the Jackson National piece, that was you know, hundreds of parts that all have to be numbered and really meticulous. And so this piece was just part of a larger experiment of me coming back to these gatherings of materials and playing with them and seeing what happened when light hit them. This was on March 21st, the, sol the vernal equinox. And there was this moment where the sun came into the space and it lined up right with the seam on the wall. And so the sun was hitting all those payettes and shiny materials on the ground, and it was projecting the light and the reflection back up onto the wall, which was in shadow. And I was just back in love again with, with my process and my materials and like this idea of abstraction. And um, instead of using acrylic paint, I started to use spray paint right on the Duralar. And I was going to cut them up. And then I just looked at this hot pink line and I was like, oh man, I love that. I love the way it felt. It was like a big cloud, but it was also a line. And um, these other pieces are hand sanded shiny mylar. So that, or duralar, which is that material I've been using for 20 plus years now. Um, and so this, this installation was a huge... Uh, leap for me. And on the right, you can see this little um, sort of, it looks kind of like a fingerprint. Well, that's a, that's done with thousands of silver payettes. And um, I had actually taken one of my drawings for another project and put it into a computer program that turned it into a pattern of dots. And uh, I saw it and I thought, gosh, this looks like my work and yet it's totally new. And it has the same motion and organic suggestiveness, but 
it's mysterious. It's more abstract. And it's also kind of more suggestive. So the funny thing is the only way I could actually do this, this image had been sitting on my computer for like four years. Um, in 2018, when I was at Oxbow, the only way I could do it was because I knew it was only going to be there for two months. And somehow I was just like, okay, I'm going to just try this. So I got thousands of silver payettes and pinned them all to the wall in that pattern. And it just, it's led to a whole new body of work, which you'll see a couple examples of later that are now being made for buildings. So this amazing experiment turned into something more. Another thing that really set me free recently was I did a residency at Bullseye Glass in Portland in 2019. And it brought me back to kind of this raw um, color, transparency, and um, less self-conscious, less perfect uh, kind of work. And so these are glass experiments, these little drawings. And um, I just got back into like the idea of just making things a little bit faster and quicker. And that was on the heels of another opportunity I had in 2019. I was also invited to go to Kansas City Art Institute as an artist in residence and make an installation there. And I was there for three weeks. And so I started after Bullseye, I started making all of these spray paint on Duralar sheets. I just started cutting them up into little rectangles. And it led me to this whole new kind of expression, which the work on the right to me is like a willow tree, but it's just further abstracted and completely um, in a new place, but also my work again. The planes are two or three layers of uh, a spray painted uh, Duralar. They're just cut out really quickly and then arranged on the wall. And um, this show also happened in uh, uh, several months after my dad died. And it got me thinking a lot about time. And um, he had this beautiful song that he shared with me that, that was called Once Upon a Time by Jay McShann. Is, I don't know if any of you are jazz lovers, but it's a beautiful song. And there's a willow tree in it. And I started, you know, kind of building on those themes of, passage of time. This is a nice shot of me up on the ladder. I spent a lot of time on the ladder <laughs> with the hammer <laughs> and um, pins. And these are some other uh, great shots. So here's a really interesting thing that I think happened in this work, which is that I had the pure abstraction of the color going on. And I brought all of these spray painted blue things with me. And then they fell out onto the floor. And these two things accidentally fell on top of each other and it looked like a cloud. And I was just like, I kind of gasped. It looks so much like the sky that I thought, can I even do that? It looks like a photograph of a cloud. And then I started thinking about the idea of um, the book of hours, which is like a prayer book and the idea of the passage of time and the way the sky looks at different times of day. And it's not a new idea. Artists have kind of tapped into that, but it was really poignant for me, especially after my dad dying and thinking about a lifetime of sunsets or sunrises and different moments. So I spread those on the floor and then I did another um, piece that was hidden behind that was like a setting sun. And I used the payettes on the floor this time. And you can kind of see the way that that um, reflected. I love the relationship between the horizon line and a reflection of something. And the color's not even really coming through. It's this fluorescent orange that you can just feel in your stomach when you look at it. And then this was amazing. This was at um, the afternoon and I had the blinds pulled down and the sun came in and did this amazing thing with light. So this transitory effect of light is, you can see it here and you get it on the piece behind you too, like at different times of day and the, when the light comes through here and does the thing with the shadows um, on the wall. So I try to build that into my work. And then I did a second version of this. This is at my gallery. This show was in March of 2020. <laughs> I flew into New York 
I got my show up and then an hour before the opening, it was canceled. And I caught the next plane home to Seattle and everything shut down. So the good thing is my show wasn't seen by anybody, but I did get photos of it. So, um, and so here's a good close up of what those Duralar pieces look like. And I'm getting close to the end. And this one, I kind of did everything. You can see there's a Payette piece. Um, and there's, I took the idea of the Book of Hours and really expanded it. So those panels are almost eight feet tall. And it was really fun. You can probably remember that first image I showed you of my early undergraduate painting. And I'm kind of back to light again in that atmosphere. And then this is an image of him in my studio, just so you can kind of see how it feels. And then um, the, the work that was in the next room was laser cut aluminum. So the piece on the left is called Planet and the piece on the right is called Transmission. And this is a closer up view of Planet. I like the way it looks like it's breaking apart. It's sort of, felt apropos for 2020 in hindsight. <laughs> and also this show was kind of like the idea of taking that really long view of something. I felt like it was kind of about um, the macro view rather than the micro view. And this piece um, was called Cloud Islands. Uh, I think all my work has a light weightlessness to it and kind of a floating quality that I don't quite understand, but I think it's present and I really like it. Um, and then this was view. And that brings me to the last few images from my most recent show in Seattle. I hadn't had a show here in 10 years. My last show, solo show was in 2011. And uh, I just had this show in, um, let's see, February, March of 2021. And you can just see me continuing these themes of going more toward abstraction and um, less toward earthy realms and more like cloud and color and light. Um, I have a series of really tiny drawings in the show. And um, this piece, these two acrylic discs uh, that were spray paint on acrylic, one was called Dawn and this one's called Dusk. And here's a close up of dawn and the close up of dusk. The, the, color, the color doesn't quite communicate in this image, but you know, it was purpley and dark, and the other one was kind of brighter and light. And then here's just a couple tiny collages. This one's called Firmament. And this one is Floating Place. And those are all uh, spray paint on Duralar. And um, this is a nice shot because it shows you uh, the actual scale of them in the gallery. And then I just wanted to show you this final set of images is a big commission I just completed for a biotech firm on Lake Washington. Um, I'm going to skip to that. Using the Payettes. So this piece is called Pattern Field. It's 22 feet tall and 19 feet wide, and it's made of thousands of those circular discs. Um, this time I figured out instead of just the pins, they're actually mounted now on clear acrylic circles. And um, this piece is so perfect for the biotech firm because it taps into just a literal embodiment of what they do. It's like the idea of a process the idea of something vast and unfolding that's self-replicating, that is the meeting of nature and technology and um, kind of a language. So all of those are embodied in this piece. And um, as you walk in front of it, the payettes kind of shine. Some of them are reflective and some of them aren't. And that's a nice detail shot of just standing on the floor looking up. So that's the last image. And I hope I haven't saturated you with too many. I got through that pretty close to my 45 minutes. <laughs> so um, I hope that you can see the arc 
and you can kind of fit in to see where the piece that you all live with inhabits in my range of work. And um, hopefully you see the relationship between the concerns that keep coming through um, and repeating. So as much as we think we're doing something new as artists, we also were like, oh my gosh, that's how I felt when I looked at those paintings from a little while ago and thought, oh, I see that work from 30 years ago. Here it is again, coming to the surface. So um, yeah, it's, it's amazing to be able to do this and um, to be able to share it with you. So thank you for your attention and time. And if you have questions, yes. So those are attached both with pins and then there's a little bit of adhesive on the back of each disc. So it kind of sticks to the wall and then the pin helps it stay. The question was, how do I attach those to the wall? Duralar is spelled D-U-R-A-L-A-R. -A -A and it's like, you probably heard of Mylar. And it's just another brand name. Mylar is like Kleenex. It's actually like a brand name for polyester film. So, yeah. Yes. That was a delightful talk. Thank you so much. I remember seeing one of your works years and years ago that was in the crack of the gallery. Mm -hmm. You didn't talk about cracks. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I almost threw an image of that piece in there. Thank you. Um, well, I talked about the floor and I kind of talked about the rectangle of the canvas and how I felt like my work tries to explore, explode that it exists outside of it and kind of use the wall. And I love there's those spaces like the space between the wall and the floor is a really interesting space. And it's like an in-between space. It's also kind of like a stairway. That's why I like stairways too, because you're going somewhere. It's a transitional zone. And I also was talking about, and this will be abstract because we're not looking at it, but I love looking down on artwork. It gives you this other perspective. We're so used to looking at pictures that are facing us on that plane. And when you start to slip off that plane, it just does something to your vantage point as a viewer and what you associate and where, where you go and kind of distance and space. So I kind of like playing with that. And um, as I've shown over the years in galleries, it's harder to make work that is like that, that is changing and moving. And, and so I don't try to move away from it, but in some ways it has. So whenever I get a chance, well, like the cloud, the book of hours piece did that. It inhabited the crack, the space between the floor and the wall. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and asked. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Margaret. What kind of pieces do you have hanging in your own? Uh, yeah, so of my own? So I have um, one of my favorite pieces I ever made was um, this little beautiful little drawing of um, under a lar of kind of like a melting heart form. And it didn't happen on purpose. I was painting one of those days of painting tiny things and it dried and it looked like a melting heart and it was really beautiful and and I loved it. And I had a really good friend at the time. And um, I was like, you know what? I love this piece, but I'm going to give it to him. And we actually ended up becoming a couple. And now we're married. And I get to live with that piece that I gave away, <laughs> which is really awesome. <laughs> and so I have a little piece of my, I have just a couple little pieces of mine in the house. Like I, um, I have a lot of other artists work, but Somehow it's like, because I have it in my studio all the time, I don't have it, like I don't need to have it in my house. It's like everywhere in my mind and brain. And so, you know, it's there even if it's not hanging on my wall. But yeah, that's what I have in my house is two little tiny pieces. Yeah, yes.
Uh, this has been really a treat. Thank you. And um, I'm, oh, I'm glad we still have this up here. How do you translate that uh, very geometric shape from your head to the wall? Yeah, I wish I had 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 um, time to throw in a couple of progress uh, images, but my computer is so disorganized right now that I'm like, oh my gosh, where are those images from that show the install? So what I do is all of the compositions using Piats are actually generated on my computer. So I even move the little dots around sometimes and cut them out. And actually all like the blue composition came from the silver composition. I cut and pasted and changed and morphed and adapted it, but it's in a PDF format and PDFs don't distort when you blow them up big. So I will print at the printer, a three foot wide by 10 foot long sheet that has the dot pattern on it. We put it up on the wall and then we make a little tiny dot with a pin at the top of each circle. And then you tear away some of the paper and put the dots up. It's very low tech. I was thinking, I think like Da Vinci or the Italian muralists would do it too. They would put up these big sheets of paper and put little dots on the wall that help you map out where you're going. So that's how it's done. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're I'm welcome. glad I asked. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. I see another question back there. I used to teach. Um, maybe that comes through because I like to. <laughs> In fact, if I hadn't had the images up here, I would probably have just been blabbing without like looking at the computer so much. Um, I used to teach and loved it. And I taught for a number of years. And then um, in 2006, I was able to quit my teaching job because I love teaching. But I thought, gosh, if I really had my dream come true, I would be able to do this full time. And so I was able to make the transition. And yeah. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, another question. Thanks for all your questions. It's fun when you give a talk and people actually have questions. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if a technician is here who could get rid of this screen, but I wondered if you would talk a little bit about your um, your ideas when you were building, designing, and then building that sculpture. Yeah. And then also give us your thoughts about it now. Yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> All right. I know. Well, it's really it's really fun to come back and see it again after so many years. And I um sometimes as an artist it's hard because you put your work out there and you're your worst critic and you're just like, oh. I've, I've done that many times that I don't feel that way about this piece. Um, and even though this piece is very representational, I think that it's a really important pivotal moment in my work. And I explored, um, maybe I can, can I take the mic off? That's so great. <laughs> I should have done that from the beginning. <laughs> um, I, So first of all, it started with me thinking about the idea of the stairway and how to create something that would have a presence and also wouldn't be attached to the ceiling. And then I was just thinking about like the marks of grass and the way grass moves. And I love that grass is a beautiful color and it's gentle and delicate. And it's also like a drawn mark. 
So I was thinking about just cross hatching and drawing and repeated form. And then there's just a metaphor of the wind, you know, and like the wind is change and motion and just all of those levels of poetry of what the wind is. And, um, and it seemed a little too minimal to just have like these repeated soft grass forms. So then the idea of this, this undercurrent of something else that was deeper and that's where the darker kind of greens and the other shapes came in. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I got off the, off, off of the camera. Okay. So, and then I, you know, the red is, is like, um, the formally just, the red and green are really good together because they're complementary colors. But also um, for me, there was a significant moment in my work of transitioning from abstraction to representation or what I like to say nameable things are, where I actually started to use this color and it was blood. And I was like, blood, blood red. That's, that's what that color is. And I did some falls that were blood red that were 20 feet tall. And, you know, and I, I was thinking of red, and then I was thinking of like the blood red and how it's a color we see in flowers, but it's also the color of like the pulse of our bodies, you know, and representations of a red that has that kind of tinge where it could signify like a fluid. And you might not have ever thought of blood when you were thinking of that, but it's kind of that red, you know, and then the great thing for me was trying to figure out what I could use um, instead of Duralar. And I, that's when I both, I used metal and I'd never used glass before. And so this is actually, um, you know, I had only used glass this one time in a work and I collaborated with a glass blower in Tacoma called M Space. I, th I think they might still be around and we figured out a way to blow these glass blobs and then smash them so that they made um, non-perfect blobs that felt very painterly and like my drawing hand. And then um, kind of just like the feel and the motion of it, I think it's very, it has this energy and current in it. And, and then I called it wind's reflection because um, the grasses are upside down <laughs> and uh and they look great in the, the stairway, but it also seemed like hopefully it was giving you that feeling of reflecting the wind and what it feels like to be outside. I thought too about like in a space like this, wanting to make something that just felt alive, you know, and I'll never forget when we were installing it, this older gentleman came up with his walker and he just told me it made him feel really good every time he looked at it. And, and that really, like, I was almost in tears because that that's what I wanted. And so it was great when he just, I could tell he was feeling the motion in it. So, um, yeah, I continue to feel like that piece really holds up for me uh, as a work. And um, I'm glad to see it here. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm curious about some of the installations that are done with thousands of pins. Yeah. <laughs> if they're in a gallery and someone wants that, how do they, how do you reproduce it? When you sell oh, it? like, the, so all of those pieces that are assembled with pins, like the orange circles or the, the, the green pieces, I, I would number every single one of them and then make a template. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Yeah. It's a little meticulous. <laughs> I didn't know I was that obsessive. Artists are all artists are obsessive, but <laughs> yeah. So there's lots of numbering. Yeah. You have to be very. So you have it down on a piece of paper. With a design so that you can reproduce Yeah. It. So I will take it. I'll wow. put it on the wall. I'll number all the parts, circle all the holes as I take it down, put a clear piece up trace where the holes were. And part of the reason I do that is because I also figured out my compositions are not accidental. They're very, very meticulously like obsessed over. And so I used to think, oh, it wouldn't matter if it was put up a little different. It actually does. And that's when I just realized 
I was like, I'm going to have to number every single one of these pieces, but that's the only way to get it to look like it's supposed to. So if this piece were ever taken down, every single one of those would be given a number. And then as you remove them from the wall, you'd mark the holes and put the number by each hole. And it, it can be taken down. The blue willow piece that I showed you, the smaller one, the image of, that was purchased by a collector in LA. And I have a great friend who's an installer down there. And apparently he's taken it down and put it up three times. <laughs> so yeah, they, I know it's smaller than that piece, but yeah. But you know, that's the only way that you can get it to do what it's doing. You can't compromise on that. I would never want to attach that to a big piece of wood or something because it wouldn't look the same on the wall. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much, everybody. I don't, if you want to keep asking questions, I can keep talking or if you want to come up and talk to me privately or Thank <laughs> you.